Well, all right, all right. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Hot Seat Automotive Podcast. It's your buddy CJ here. And tonight, we're talking about all things automotive industry, car guy stuff, all the things automotive enthusiasts really love talking about. Cars, cars, cars. Guys, this is the home of Real Gearhead Talk. Real Gearhead Talk. This is the place to be. Gearheads, petrol heads, car guys, car girls. Welcome, everybody. If you're a current subscriber, thank you so much. Love you guys. Welcome back. If you're new to the channel, please do give me a like and subscribe. Would love to have you participate in our community, in our dialogue, getting on here and, and talking about cars and comparing cars, new cars, exotic cars, classic cars, automotive industry development, automotive enthusiast events, you name it, we talk about it here on Hot Seat Automotive Podcast. So welcome, everybody. Leave me comments. I'll respond to all the comments I can. Tonight, we got a very special episode. Guys, I'm excited about this. If you're an automotive enthusiast, you need to be here with your buddy, CJ, who loves cars just as much as you do. And tonight, we're talking about a legend. Guys, join me in celebrating all things BMW M. Specifically, we're going to get into the M3 and why this car is so beloved and appreciated and has a cult-like following across continents, across the globe, from a motorsports heritage standpoint, and just with automotive enthusiasts across generations. For six generations of this car, we've got a cult-like loyal following. And we have to ask ourselves, why? Why does the M3 have the following that it does? Let's get into this. Let's get right into it, guys. You know, and there's just so much ground to cover here. And your buddy CJ is so excited about it. Let's take a look at some things together. Guys, where did BMW M really get its start? What's the genesis? And we're going back a ways. Look at this car. 1972, the BMW 3.0 CSL. Okay, we're talking about the creation of BMW Motorsport. Before there was M. This car is not an M3. But what this is, was BMW's entry point into the realm of motorsports competition. BMW wanted to start racking up the wins and making a presence for itself. Le Mans, Sebring, F1, you name it. <laughs> BMW wanted to be right up there with Mercedes and all the other competitors. Porsche, Mercedes, you name it. Okay? So much of what we think about today in terms of an M3 or an M4, we'll talk about that later, can be traced back to this car, the BMW 3.0 CSL. We're talking about an inline six producing about 200 horsepower, about 215 foot pounds of torque. But you guys familiar with homologation? This is where the regulatory body that runs the motorsports events, the racing, the sanctioning body for the various races says, okay, BMW, Ferrari, Porsche, whoever, if you want to compete, in this bracket or area of racing, you must produce X number of consumer available production cars that allow you to take that platform and compete in motorsports in the racing circuit. So that's what we're looking at here. This, this BMW uh, 3.0 CSL was really the beginning and in many ways, BMW's entree point into the realm of motorsports competition on a world stage. Any discussion about the BMW motorsports history and the M badge has to include a discussion of the BMW M1 supercar. Mid-engine rear-wheel drive. This thing came out in 1978. Had assistance from other manufacturers whether it's Lamborghini or others who played a part in this. This also had an inline six engine. Talking about a vehicle that topped out at around 165 miles per hour. This was really the first M car. If we want to talk about the lineage going back to where that M badge first 
manifested itself, if you will. The M1, by virtue of its model number, is kind of really where all of this started. They only made around 450 of these cars. They're super highly collectible. And, you know, kind of mixed results in motorsports. I'm not, uh, I'm not going to sit here and dissect the full history of motorsports. That's not really what we do on this channel. But I know that this car had some success. But then due to timing and some other things going on in the motorsports realm, I, I don't think it was what, BMW wanted to get out of it, if you will. But again, a part of that M heritage was this M1 mid-engine rear-wheel drive supercar. Look at those wheels. If that doesn't just scream late 70s, early 80s. You know, the funny thing about this, and of course, it's got the pop-up headlights as well. It's just such an indicator of that era. And a couple things about this car, though. I think even though it dates back to the late 1970s, it's still got some consistency in design cues. I mean, look at the nose, look at look at the grill, the, the sort of grill within the grill up front. Look at that BMW logo. Uh, the, the the some of the understatement, if you will, of 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 the interior. Uh, I claim you're still looking at classic BMW design cues that we can trace through later generations of cars. So pretty cool stuff here with the BMW M1 supercar. Uh, did make it to production, but only about 450 of these. And they are available, although highly collectible right now. Guys, I think it's also important to talk about some other things that really endeared the BMW brand to Generation X as well as the Millennials. Gen X and Millennials, because when I think about the backbone of the consumer base and the fan base for the M3s over the decades, you know, you kind of have to go back and look at history and no discussion. Again, for those that were actually there when all this was going down <laughs> in the late 70s, early 80s, you can't understate the significance of this car. So I want to show you this and leave me comments. Let me know what you guys think. Guys, are you kidding me? BMW 325i convertible. You know, for all of the discussion about the M series, whether it's an M3, okay, or the M1, or later on the M4, if you actually trace back where a lot of this loyalty and engagement and history with BMW comes from, particularly for Generation X, these 325Is, when they came on the scene in the 80s, this car became like an ideal or a goal, an attainable goal for, you know, anyone who was Gen X getting that first job, or maybe your parents, you were fortunate, you came from a family that had some means, had some wealth, maybe you had one of these, you were able to go to school with it, or maybe your, your mom or your dad had one. This car was a status symbol. This was an attainable status symbol. Who remembers the commercial marketing campaigns that talked about not only the ultimate driving machine, but the ultimate tanning machine? The BMW 325i was actually billed as the ultimate tanning machine. And that was a successful ad campaign. And that goes into the full lore and history, I say, and the appeal and some of that loyalty we've seen over the decades with BMW. You know, this is a rabid fan base. When you're into BMWs, it's not just transportation, okay? It's, it's the racing heritage, the motorsports heritage, the performance heritage, the lineage of the different lines and generations of these vehicles are very important to BMW enthusiasts. OK, and it's not unlike Porsche. It's not unlike Mustang. It's not unlike Corvette. Certain other cars where it's more than just a car, if that makes sense. This is this is really where you talk about automotive enthusiast loyalty to a brand that gets into that realm of passion. I mean, seriously, how many, you know, you talk to enough BMW enthusiasts and you really get into it. They're really into their cars. And I, tr I claim that a lot of that traces back 
decades. And it's not just like the M1 or the 3.0 CSL where so much of that comes from, but it's this car, the 325i that was mass produced that so many Gen Xers and even millennials drove around in, their parents had one, you know, it just, and, and, and the, the other cool thing about it is the 325i has some of those design cues that have remained consistent with BMW over the years. The kidney grills, that little grill within a grill, the four headlights, the fog lights, the wheels, the overall shape of the car, some of that boxiness, if you will, it, you know, the understated interior, all of those things have lent themselves to a consistency, to a loyalty, uh, you know, just an appreciation of brand that has always stood for European sophistication with a performance heritage, legitimate driving experience, being a driver's car with really handling, steering, performance, acceleration that was right up there with some of the best cars on the road at the time. And this has been a consistent theme for BMW across the decades and across the generations. But again, don't sleep on the, BM the significance of the BMW 325i. Was the 325i a performance monster? Not at all. It was a light, sporty, fun European sports car, you know, that, that had some, some unique design attributes over every other Mustang or Camaro or Corvette that you'd see in the market, right? But the key thing about this was that it was mass produced and attainable. And a lot of folks really got into these cars and a lot of the, the loyalty to the BMW brand the three series and ultimately the M3 can be traced back, I claim, to this 325i. Because back in the day, not just anybody could afford the premium that you paid for the first gen M3. And since we're talking about it, let's take a look at it. Guys, here it is, the legend, the absolute legend, the E30 M3 came out in 1986. 1986 is a big year. If you're a BMW person, you're a BMW motorsports enthusiast, you're an M3 enthusiast, 1986 is your year because that's when the E30 factory race car came out. 1986 BMW E30 M3. Are you kidding me? Interestingly enough, this car had a four-cylinder. You're talking about around 190 horsepower, somewhere around there. Uh, so this thing, you know, wasn't, you know, huge displacement. It was more of a high rev dual overhead cam, uh, four-cylinder, came with a five-speed manual transmission. You know, the interesting thing about this, that E30 M3, was that it legitimately had many, many upgrades over a regular 3 Series. So this wasn't just a badge job or a body kit. Body panels were replaced, different brakes, different suspension, windshield, that wing on the back, just many, many performance upgrades to give it better aerodynamics, okay, and better performance. So you paid a premium for these cars. And here's a, here's a bit of a surprise that many of you may not know. These cars were not a big seller. These cars sat on lots, you know, because, you know, I think at the time, nobody could foresee that these cars would become huge collector's items as they are today nor could anyone foresee the significance of the BMW M badge. Nobody knew what an M3 was back in the day, right? So in many, in many cases, these cars sat on the lots. They were slow movers. They were slow to sell. They only made about 17 or 18,000 of these E30 M3s. Um, so what does that mean today? Given the following, the heritage, the loyalty, all the things we just talked about, these are collector's items. These are special cars. So what we're talking about here, if you want to get into a nice one, you're probably looking at like 80K to 150K. Okay, we're talking about an expensive collector's car. Might there be ones that are at a lower price point, kind of drivers, you know, kind of dogged out, still cars you could have fun with? Absolutely. But to really get a, a good example, you're looking at big bucks. Okay, guys, let's keep going because that's what we do here on Hot Seat Automotive Podcast. Guys, please do leave me those comments. Let's talk about it. Let me know what you think uh, about all things M3. 
And let's take a look at this, the E36 M3. This car came out and had a run from 1992 to 1999. But interestingly enough, this car was not available in the United States until 1995. Okay. Uh, I think one of the interesting things about the E36 M3 is that this wasn't a factory race car like the E30 was. What we're talking about here is BMW made basically a grand touring car, okay, that also had some performance enhancements and that M3 badge. Definitely understated and more subtle than like, in my opinion, than like a Mercedes or something like that. Uh, but nonetheless, you're looking at sort of another class of car. And these cars, the big thing to know is that this was the introduction of that inline six in an M3. So this was the first formal introduction of what was to, to be sort of the bedrock for nearly all M3s, nearly all, we'll talk about that in a moment, that inline six. You're talking about 240 to 300 horsepower um, in North America, a lot of folks, you know, will kind of begrudge the fact that we got the the lower power version of that power plant, uh, less powerful engine. This car had uh, not only a manual transmission available, but also an automated manual. So you did have an automatic option in this car. If you wanted to snag one of these today, you're looking at between 20,000 and 50,000, a little bit of research I did. You can snag good examples, drivers. These cars respond well to mods. Uh, a lot of folks like to buy these and build track cars out of them. Uh, some of the criticism, criticisms of this car in, include the fact that, you know, the interior wasn't great. In addition to being sort of understated, just wasn't a great interior. Those plastic headlights, you know, the other thing too is that this car didn't have a lot of differentiation aesthetically from an appearance standpoint over the regular three series. That was one of the criticisms, but I claim the, these, these cars stand out as icons. You know, when you see one of these, when you see a survivor, especially a, a survivor, unmolested, unmodified, if you will, E36 M3, it just screams back to that era, sort of early to late nineties, just a real great example. And again, these cars are attainable today. Uh, and and uh, and are known to be good track cars. If you're looking to build something affordable and attainable and manageable that you can also take to the track, E36 might be a good option for you. But then also as sort of a you know a weekend cruiser, uh, absolutely. You're make no mistake. You're a BMW M enthusiast with your E36, and they can be had you know at a reasonable price point. One of the limitations, though, I'd say with the E36, uh, not so much a limitation, but perhaps one of the reasons why they can be had at a, at a reasonable price point is because of what came next. Look at this thing. Guys, BMW M3 E46 was a performance leap forward over the E36 or E30. In fact, leaps and bounds. And not just from a performance standpoint, I claim the styling, the appearance, the aesthetics of this car, really now we're starting to look at what I would consider to be more of a, more of a modern, aggressive, grand touring slash sports car with some, some motorsports heritage for the road. And this thing put up solid numbers. This car put up big performance numbers. We're talking about 330, 340 horsepower stock, okay? Upgraded interior, uh, also available with an automatic transmission. Manuals are a heck of a lot more desirable. The story on this car is that it almost throws shade on the E36 in some ways, just because the amount of performance out of the box you can get with an E46 is so much better than an E36 talking about somewhere around 100 more horsepower stock. Also, I claim the appearance and the aesthetics. This car starts to look a lot more modern, or maybe another way of saying that is the E36 is starting to look a bit dated. And again, it's basically a classic car now, the E36. But having said that, this E46, I claim, just looks so much more substantial and chunky 
and sophisticated than that E36 in every way. And it also had the performance above and beyond where that E36 was. So these cars are highly desirable. They made about 85,000 of these cars. So quite a few of them out there. A lot of the ones that you see out there used are, are well-loved. They've been driven a lot. So to find a good example, you know, a survivor that hasn't been ragged out, that hasn't had the wheels driven off of it, you know, you're probably looking at close to 60K, maybe more. You can snag these anywhere from 20K to 60K, but on the lower end of that range, you're going to have higher mileage cars or cars that have been, you know, torn apart, <laughs> wrenched on, modified in accidents, that type of thing. To get a nice one, you're going to have to pay, especially in a desirable color with a, with a trim package that you might want. But make no mistake, the E46 was a big step up over the E36 in so many ways. Guys, let's talk about what followed the E46, because things just might get controversial. Look at this, E90 BMW M3. We're talking about the introduction of an M3 with a V8 as the standard engine. Are you kidding me? M3 muscle car. We're talking about more luxury than what were, was available in an E36 or E46. But the big news here is that 400 horsepower V8. So a departure from the inline six that was available in the E36 or the E46, and certainly leaps and bounds ahead of where the four cylinder E30 was. This car was, this car put up big performance numbers, just a different sound a different feel, a different engine platform. At the same time, though, this car was facing big competition. You know, if you think about what Mercedes-Benz was doing with AMG, Audi, with cars like the S4, so on and so forth, you know, BMW had some serious European competition during this era of the E90 in the various iterations of the E90. You had the E90, the E92, the E93, which are sort of iterations on this platform. Interestingly enough, the E90 M3 was the first M3 available with a true dual clutch transmission. So dual clutch automated transmission available. This car ran from 2007 to 2013. They built about 65,000 of these E90s, which is kind of interesting. Today, if you want to snag one of these, they're available, you know, uh, between $18,000 and $60,000. Now, naturally, on the lower end of that continuum, you're going to have higher mileage cars with potential issues, cars that have maybe been in accidents. If you want a true survivor, low mileage, unmolested, something that's been a garage queen, something like that, or very well maintained and cared for, you're going to be looking at forty, fifty thousand, sixty thousand dollars, which puts you at a price point with some other incredible cars as well. But if you really want one of these, if you want to have that that E90 with that V8 engine, this would be the one to snag. V8 rear wheel drive BMW M3. Are you kidding me? Guys, for the next generation, BMW went back to the straight six. Let's take a look at this together. BMW F80 M3. We got a few things to talk about here, guys. Number one, this is the introduction of the twin turbo inline six, putting out over 400 horsepower stock. So there's that. Number two, this is where there was the split the M3 is now specifically a four-door sedan, and the M4 is the coupe and convertible. So goodbye to the two-door M3. Hello to the M4 coupe. Other interesting things about this car uh, in include the fact that, you know, BMW, this is when you're getting into a modern high-tech car here, guys. A lot of technology, a lot of electronics in this car. They also used aluminum and carbon fiber to sort of lighten the load here, the overall vehicle weight to get some better performance. You know, a lot of engineering goes into these M3s and a lot of technology advancement. This isn't just a badge job. Like, there's a reason why these cars have the following that they do and why BMW has sold literally tens and tens and tens of thousands of these over the years. 
because these are legitimate performance sedans and coupes. Unbelievable. And this car was really the introduction of that forced induction, in this case, twin turbo, where, you know, even though even though you, you lost two cylinders from the E90 to the F80, you actually gained output and performance, which is kind of impressive and kind of cool. Since there was the split between the M3 and the M4, total manufacturing production numbers are a bit off. So we're looking at like 34,000 M3s. That doesn't account for the two-door coupes or the convertibles. We're talking about the four-door M3 here, looking at about 34,000 of these manufactured in that F80 generation. If you want to snag one of these today, there's quite the price range. You can get into one, $28,000, dollars $40,000, higher mileage. You know, you could step up for a lower mileage example, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000. So again, you're looking at a not so inexpensive car. This is a European performance car. It's a BMW. It's also a high tech car. You know, I would say go into this eyes wide open. If you buy one of these, you have to consider warranty, mileage, maintenance. You know, these could be factors affecting total cost of ownership. That can be said for pretty much any car and certainly any of the BMWs on the list here tonight that we're talking about, but just really something to be conscious of. I, I do know folks who've owned these cars, any generation of these these European cars, particularly the BMWs, not, not just the BMWs, but cost of ownership, maintenance, repairs can be high. It's a consideration, but absolutely incredible performance coming out of this F80 M3. Guys, let's get controversial because why not, right? What came after the F80? Let's get up to the modern era here, guys. Here it is. A little bit of controversy tonight in the world of BMW M3 enthusiasts. Let's talk about it. The G80 M3. First things first, we got to talk about the grill. Now, when this first came out, there were memes. There was controversy. There was a lot of shade thrown at it. I'll be honest with you. What does your buddy CJ think? I kind of like it. I like it because it is disruptive. It doesn't look like every other M3 or every other car on the road. So, like so many other things, I think this design and this grill has really started to grow on folks. Will history be kind or unkind to it overall? I don't know. I'm seeing more and more of these on the road, uh, but it is a departure from sort of that mini kidney, dual kidney gr grill that we saw in so many other previous generation M3s. Yeah, it's kind of in your face with those uh, big black fangs, if you will, or those two big black kidney grills. Listen, I think they look fantastic. Maybe not fantastic, but let's say they look differentiated. They stand out. You will not mistake this car for anything else. Okay, the other thing to note about this, in addition to sort of that controversial grill, is big performance. We're talking about a 500 horsepower M3 out of the box. When you look at the competition trim, you know, this is a, this is a very fast, very quick car. A lot of power, a lot of torque. Also with a twin turbo 3.0 straight six. These cars are being modded and folks are getting big power out of them with those mods. Another cool thing I think about the new M3 is that they are available in a manual uh, for those that need to have three pedals, although only in the rear wheel drive model. They're also available in an all wheel drive model, but you can only get the all wheel drive with a dual clutch automated transmission. The other, the other neat thing is the interiors. I claim BMW has done some really innovative, striking things with the interiors. You can option these out with sports seats and carbon fiber. They really look sharp and uh, you can really do some cool customization. Now, the one thing that none of us can disagree on, and leave me comments if you do disagree, but you can't is that Isle of Man green is the best color for the new M3. Guys, what do you think? I think this Isle of Man green is really, really cool. If I was going to buy one of these cars, I would snag one in Isle of Man green. I've had my eye on a few. I also like the blue 
that's available in this generation of the M3. But I got to tell you, that Isle of Man green, absolutely beautiful and really different than kind of any other cars on the road. And I'm not a green car guy by any stretch, but I really like the Isle of Man green. In terms of special editions, BMW has done something really cool. And let's take a look at it together. Guys, what are we talking about here? Take a look at the BMW M4 CSL. Now, the CSL trim and nameplate harkens back to that 1970s 3.0 CSL. This is basically a track car for the road, if you will. This is a motorsports-themed BMW M4, 100% street legal. Uh, it's got racing seats in it. It's got the styling cues. It's got different performance components uh, and a performance boost over the base M4. I already told you that years ago, BMW split the M3 and the M4 nameplates so that the two-door versions are all M4s. The four doors are the M3s. But this car is available as an M4. It's at a higher price point. I mean, you're looking at about 100 k to get into one of these, 110 120 130 Right now, this is a 2023 model year. Uh, I've heard some, some, some shade thrown at it because of the price point for what you're getting. But listen, if you want your ultimate G80 BMW, you know, brand new with a factory warranty that's not going to look like every other M3 or M4 on the road. This is this is a fantastic option. I mean, how many of these have you seen on the road? It is a limited run. I think they're making 3,000 or 3,300, something like that for the year or, or the, the total number in the run. So this will, you know, this will end up being a special limited, limited edition car. You know, the other down thing, in addition to the high price point, it's only available with those racing seats, to my knowledge. And I know they wouldn't be for me, for example. If you're looking for a car that's more comfortable, you could do some miles in, depending on, you know, your age and your, your body type, this car either is or isn't right for you. Uh, you know, and again, I get it. This is race car theme and, and race car M4. Having said that, Unless you want those extreme carbon fiber seats, this may not be the right one for you. But guys, those are some of my thoughts on the history of BMW motorsports and specifically the M3. And I wanted to kind of talk about why this car has such a loyal following and why this car is so loved by BMW enthusiasts. And it's easy to tell why. You know, there is a lot to like with the BMW M3 and now the M4. Uh, it, it's just it, it, every generation has gotten better in many ways from a performance standpoint. More horsepower, more torque, better handling, more technology, more luxury, better interiors, styling and appearance packages, special editions. There has always been something cool about a BMW M3. You know, when you see it, it just screams motorsports. But then it also has that understated aspect that I think is pervasive with all BMWs, where it's not kind of in your face like certain brands of in, in certain model cars. There is a level of sophistication and understatement to it, but it also has that that air of very serious motorsports enthusiast and very serious performance car. And the thing about the BMW M3s is that they actually prove it. You know, the car actually is a legitimate performer. So guys, those are some of my thoughts on the BMW M3. What do you guys think? Please leave me those comments. Do you have one of these cars? Have you owned one? Uh, would you own another one? What's been your experience? Why are you a fan of the M3s? Or why are you maybe an Audi fan or a Mercedes fan or fill in the blank? Maybe you're a Porsche enthusiast or something from JDM. Let me know. Leave me the comments. Let's talk about it. Hot Seat Automotive Podcast, your buddy CJ, signing off till the next one. I'll speak to you then. Peace.